Hello. So, I found this footage of Horizon Zero Dawn for the PS4, and um, and I was uh, rather wondering if I could share it with you whilst talking over it and perhaps answering some of your questions, uh, you know, in the capacity of a bonus video. I, I actually recorded this way back in April. It's the opening moments of the game from around about the same time it released. Uh, I have since completed the game. It's fantastic. I can thoroughly recommend it, but I haven't had much time to do bonus. Or rather, I have had time. I do now have about 40 hours of time a week to work, but I, I do tend to find myself being drawn to my main projects rather than uh, the uh, ancillary stuff. Which is unfortunate, because I do want to try and do a bonus a month. It just invariably ends up getting left by the wayside, as with so many things. In any case, let's proceed as normal, let's pretend it hasn't been three or four months, and let's answer some questions. First up, uh, wait a minute, that's not from YouTube, that's from Discord. Uh, anyway, um, Jareth Triple Zero says, How did you like the storyline of Horizon? I quite enjoyed it, yeah, it was pretty good. Uh, my major criticism probably would be that it's a little bit predictable after a certain point. But, you know, that's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, some of the best stories do follow a, a preset path. And I guess, you know, I'm more willing to forgive cliches when the gameplay is solid, like it is in Horizon. So, yeah, I enjoyed it. I actually did thoroughly enjoy the whole thing. Anyway, let's have a shifty at the old uh, comments on the last bonus video. Uh, some of these might be older questions, some of them might be irrelevant now, but, well, we'll see. I'm going to start with the newest ones, which uh, unfortunately punishes earliness and rewards tardiness, but that's, you know, just the way things are to get a relevant question. I'm Spazzo says, Hello Stu, are you going to play Destiny 2? Uh, probably. I did play quite a bit of the first Destiny, although... I didn't buy any of the DLC. I, I bought it at release, and I, I played a fair bit, yeah. But then, by the time the DLC had come out, I'd kind of lost interest. So I wasn't that deeply invested in Destiny. You know, maybe... Ooh, I don't know how much time I spent playing it. But by the time it got grindy and repetitive, and you know, all the rest of it, I did give it up. But yeah, Destiny 2, it's... I probably will play it at some point. I don't know. Um, yeah, probably. I don't know. I'm, I'm tempted to wait. Maybe wait until, like, um, the first couple of DLCs come out and then pick them all up at a reduced price. But I don't know. I might crack earlier, particularly if they have decent solo content. Because I probably will play with my friends, but, you know, sometimes you just want to play a game on your own. Uh, One Toon Army says, Do you think you're going to make another long, full documentary type video, similar to the Nuclear Fruit video? I'm aware they take a bit to make, but I have to rewatch it like five times, I love it that much. Well, it's uh, it's rather funny you should ask, because uh, the project I'm working on now is... Well, yeah, it's a documentary by any stretch of the imagination, and it's going to be feature length. Uh, feature length for me basically means an hour or more. I'm not sure if that's the true definition of feature length, but an hour feels like a big mental boundary. And uh, yeah, this one is definitely more than an hour long. So this is uh, something I've mentioned on Twitter, uh, around about the time I was starting the project. Uh, it's a video about Polybius, which is an arcade legend. It is a, a game which, well, the title of the video is going to be Polybius, the video game that doesn't exist. It's an interesting topic. Uh, more than that, though, it touches on a couple of things that I, I wanted to try because I'm, I'm acutely aware of my weak spots, you see. And one of the common criticisms of my work is that it's superficial. That it's, you know, only touches on the surface detail of stuff. And in some cases, I don't think well, that's a fair criticism, because some of my content is designed to be superficial. For instance, a brief history of graphics was always going to be superficial. It's superficial by design. And that's not a bad thing, because it's, it's a general video. It covers the entire history of video game graphics in as brief a space as possible. Um, so I wanted to do something that was counter to that. Instead of taking a very large topic and just sort of doing the surface of it, I wanted to take a topic which didn't have a lot of material to it, i.e. A, a video game that literally doesn't exist, and do a detailed examination of it. I also wanted to make sure that I did a lot of original research. 
I wanted to, you know, do more than just read the Wikipedia article, which is another common criticism. It's completely unfounded, you know. Um, even in the case where, you know, I'm doing a surface level analysis of something, there's more to writing a script than just regurgitating Wikipedia. I mean, if I were to read a Wikipedia article, it would be grand, I'm sure, but it would be very poorly structured from a narrative point of view. Because what works in a Wikipedia article doesn't necessarily work in a video. So there is an art to what I do, even if the video itself is superficial. But anyway, I wanted to sort of do something that was outside my comfort zone. Something that was very in-depth, very examinatory, if that was a word. It probably is. It is now. And uh, yeah, so something that was super, super in-depth. And uh, it had to be original research, stuff that had never been done before. And I do stand, I mean, that, I mean, there, there have been plenty of investigations into Polybius. There are plenty of videos on YouTube about Polybius. But I wanted to go beyond those. I wanted to sort of go further than anybody else had ever gone before in terms of uh, investigating this myth. And I, I like to believe that I have, because I, I, I did spend an awful long time. In fact, it's got to the point where I, um, I know the full story behind Polybius. I, um... I'm certain I know who's behind it. Of course, I'm not going to tell you now. I'm going to wait until the uh, the revelation in the video. Alongside the uh, the massive amount of original research, novel research, um, another thing I wanted to try was that of doing interviews. Because that's something I, I have considered including in Retro Hoy, and it might be something that I include in the future of Retro Hoy. So uh, I've actually, yeah, I've been reaching out to a few people of relevance. I'm going to reach out to a few more people. In fact, uh, I'm going to talk to some YouTubers. You know, what, the YouTubers of a retro gaming bent. Uh, I can, I'll definitely consider a few of those and see if I can get some sound bites from them, just talking about Polybius or whatever. And I'll have some subjects who are directly related to the myth, directly involved in the myth in some cases. And uh, yeah, I kind of want to sort of assemble it into this patchwork of, of traditional scripted video with some more some more freeform vox populi stuff which I think will work reasonably well it will uh, because some of some of the investigation it's interesting but it might get a little bit dry because this video is getting like I say it's over an hour long so to break it up a little bit to provide a bit of human interest I've uh, I'm, I'm going to conduct some interviews and include those so yeah this is it's an ambitious project, but the good news is it's um, I'm on the final stages. I'm editing right now, and there are some challenges that remain. I still have to uh, secure some interviews. I still have to do all of that, and that takes quite a bit of time to arrange and to, to sort out. There's also about 25 minutes of video left to edit, which is a sizable amount of video by any means. There's original graphics there as well that need to be done, but it's coming along. It's coming along. I don't get to work quite as much as I'd like having a, a young child, but I do get a solid 40 hours most weeks. Sometimes less, you know, there's, there's always interruptions. And stuff like uh, bonus videos, they do come out of that work budget, which is why I am sometimes averse to doing them. But I've kind of, you know, I've realised it's, it's been too long. <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I couldn't give you an estimated time of completion. I think I'm about a month away from finishing it. Which in Ahoy terms isn't that long, that's okay. But yeah, if you liked the long format of Nuclear Fruit and, um, and you know, you're interested in video game history, video game urban legends, then I think this video might be interesting. It might not be interesting, it might be incredibly boring, but that's always a risk we have to make. The good news is I have a rather more conventional video lined up after. I'm going to do another episode of Retro Ahoy, and I'm not going to reveal what game it is quite yet. As I would like it to be a surprise, uh, but I can tell you that it's not going to be an FPS. I would like to do a Duke Nukem 3D episode, I would like to do an Unreal episode, but I've decided to take a bit of a tolerance break. After doing the last season of Iconic Arms, I, I kind of want to do some stuff which isn't FPS, really. Which is why I'm doing Polybius, because it's not an FPS. And uh, why I'm doing this next game, which is definitely not an FPS. It is popular. It is universally loved, almost, and uh, I think it will be an interesting episode. But it's uh, unfortunately it's not. It's not Duke. It's not Unreal. It's not Halo. But all of these, uh, those three FPS games, they are in contention, I think, for a future episode. 
and I would like to do them. Degrate49 says, Are you going to do weapon guides on COD World War 2, just like you did for Modern Warfare series and Black Ops 1 and 2? Uh, no, probably not. Uh, it's a simple answer to that one. The fact that COD has gone back to uh, a historical setting has got me more interested, definitely. And I'll, I'll, I'll buy the game, I'll play it on release, I'll try out the multiplayer, see how it feels, see how it plays. And you never know, you never know. If I really, really, really like it, uh, then maybe I'll consider some content for it. But, I don't know. I, th the trouble is now with, with COD, I think we're definitely past peak Call of Duty. I don't think that's a controversial thing to say in the slightest. And uh, peak Call of Duty was massive. It was huge. Uh, but these days, it's competing with a lot of other games. And in terms of potential audience, I just don't think it's as large. I don't think it would perform as well as Iconic Arms, for instance. And uh, if that were true, why wouldn't I just do Iconic Arms? So, I mean, ultimately, I, I just don't feel the need to commit myself to a particular video game series. I, I do prefer being a free agent. And while I do go off gallivant in doing stupidly ambitious projects sometimes, you know, it's it's what I enjoy. And ultimately, my video output should reflect what I enjoy doing. And like I say, it might yet turn out that I really enjoy playing World War II. But, I don't know, it's not something I'm prepared to bank on and say, oh yes, definitely. Because it might turn out that I really hate the game. Well, hate is a strong word. But I don't want to be in a situation like with Ghosts, where, you know, the, the reception to Ghosts was lukewarm, the audience for the Ghosts episodes relatively small, and, you know, I, I kind of committed to doing a series for it, which I completed, to be fair, but it's it's depressing. It really is depressing to be, to be lumbered with something like that when you maybe don't want to do it. And even with the more popular CODs, you know, there's a, there's a point about halfway through the season when you think, why am I doing this? Because after Christmas, there's a big explosion of interest after Christmas, and then after that, it's dead for the summer. So you start to lose a bit of traction in terms of views, and you're like, oh, what's the point? Especially considering it's around about that time of the year when, when everybody's settled on the best gun, and everybody's using it. So, yeah, we'll see. I'm not going to rule anything out, you know, my opinion might change of the game. There might be another game that takes my fancy that I, I you know, I really do want to commit to. But from a creative point of view, I do like doing different games, different topics. And whilst on the longer projects, I do start to resent them. <laughs> there is a certain sense of satisfaction that comes from completing them. Whereas doing the same sort of thing week in, week out, the same guides over and over again, uh, I don't know. It, it it becomes unsatisfying after a fashion. Now you're still scratched up from that. How do you say that, Laurie Dyked? Surely it's not dickhead. Anyway, um, <laughs> could you do Burnout Three for Retro Hoy, or is it too new? The rule for Retro Hoy is ten years. But having said that, it would feel weird to do Gears of War. But then I suppose I mean that's eleven years old almost now. I don't know, I don't know. Burnout 3, what year was that? That was... I'm not looking it up. I will look it up in a second, but uh, I think I want to say it's late PS2 era, so about 2006, maybe. Let's have a look. Burnout 3. Takedown. Oh, it was 2004. What am I thinking of? I'm thinking of Burnout Revenge. Uh, yeah, 2004. That's... I think that's doable. That's certainly within the realm of... It's older than 10 years. Whether I do Burnout 3 Takedown, I don't know. I'd probably look at the Burnout series as a whole. It's a possible, definitely. I think there is an interesting story there. But, uh, you know, there's so many interesting stories, so many different games that I would like to cover. It's a question of getting to it eventually. But I know I know the Burnout series is well, it's well liked. So it's, it's a potential. Kyle Comic Bro says, What do you have planned in Iconic Arms? Let me guess, plasma guns, arm cannons, the firearm of undead monsters or robot, anything like that? Maybe some joke arms? I have a list somewhere, let me find it. I think it was around the time that I did the bow and arrow video that some commenters were like, Oh I see, he's run out of ideas, has he? Uh, no, no, there are hundreds of firearms I could cover. I've got a bit of a glut of World War II era arms, for instance. 
I could do a whole season of Nazi weapons. There's the MP40, the Luger, the uh, Sturmgewehr 44, the MG42, uh, the Car 98K, Mauser C96, the FG42, the Gewehr 43. There's a lot to choose from. And then you've got the Russian stuff. You've got the Mosin Nagant, you've got the PPSH 41, you've got the SVT 40, you've got the Degtyarev. A couple of British weapons worth covering. You've got the Lee Enfield, the Sten, the Bren, and then the American, of which we've done a few, but there's the Bar, the M1 Carbine, the M3 Grease Gun, Browning M2, the Springfield. And beyond that, there's probably a couple of obscurities and rarities from World War II that would warrant an episode. But that right there, that's about three additional seasons. That would take us to season four, five, six, and just with World War II. On top of that, you've also got your modern day weapons and the generic videos. Uh, generics include the flamethrower, that would be a cool episode, chainsaw, another cool episode, fists or unarmed, which is, yeah, interesting episode, crossbow as a counterpart to the bow and arrow, ray gun slash energy weapons, yeah, you know, they, they turn up in a lot of games, knives, swords as a, an in inevitable counterpart to the bow and arrow, uh, blunt instruments, I guess. That could work. Well. Pump action shotguns, sure. Lever action shotguns, okay. And then, of course, the actual meat, the actual uh, core of Iconic Arms are modern firearms. Those that you see in action films. The G36, the G3, the, uh, the AUG, the Glock, the Barrett 50 Cal, or the Special Application Scoped Rifle slash M82 slash M M107, whatever you want to call it. Uh, TDI Vector, FN Scar, uh, AK variants like the AK-12, the AK-103, 104, so on and so forth, the AK-74, the FAMAS, the Dragonov, the M4 Carbine, the Galil, the M14, the MAC-10 slash MAC-11, the M249 Saw, the F2000, the FN57, the USP, the TAR21, the Winchester M1987 Trench Gun, and the Winchester M1887 Lever Action Shotgun. The L85, in fact, the entire S80 program. The Walther PPK, the, the TMP slash MP9, the Tech 9, Sig Sauer in general, or these are. As we go further down the list, they are decreasing desirability. So some of these ideas are starting to get towards the limit, I think. Uh, the Remington 870, probably folded into the pump action episode. The Mossberg 500, ditto. Uh, Ithaca 37, same deal. And then finally the CZ 75, which was, to be fair, my favourite pistol from Black Ops. And it's a wonderful, wonderful Wonder 9. But is it necessarily interesting enough? I don't know. And that's the end of my list. Uh, according to this, about 117 lines. Although some of those, okay, yeah, some of those. There's a... I could probably get another 100 episodes if I wanted to. Uh, which is quite a lot of episodes, I'm sure you agree. So what I've read off there, that's kind of my working list. That's probably where I'll pull my selections from Season 4. And I want to do a couple of World War II weapons, and then I want to do, I don't know, just a mix, you know? So I'll, I'll pluck some of my favourites and then we'll proceed from there. I want you to find some rocks. Uh, Merry Man Devonshire says, Hmm, if you're looking for a balancing item to Iconic Arms, how about a video game history of medkits, i.e. game extending, or game life extending mechanic? This harkens back to Rogue and other RPGs, to Doom, Wolfenstein, and so on. I think this is a good candidate for the Origins format, which is something I'd like to bring back uh, pretty soon, I think. And topics relating to health, uh, I think, are definitely high up the list. There is one uh, particular thing that I'd like to talk about, and that's the, the lesser spotted chickenometer, which is an old way of, of portraying health. Before health bars were sort of codified as the standard, uh, quite often you'd have like a little roast chicken that would disappear as you lost health. <laughs> and it's an interesting little artifact from 8-bit games that kind of died off. And I'd love to do a little video about, you know, uh, what games had them, why they had them, and and why they died off. But uh, yeah, I th it's just, I don't know, I'm not sure whether that would be an Origins video or whether just a standalone one. <laughs> the history of chickenometers, as I like to call them. I don't think that's their official name, but it's definitely the name that I like to call them. 
Anyway, that's a potential. And when I say potential, I don't mean like I could do it, like I do with so many ideas that are proffered to me. I mean, uh, yeah, that's that's high up the list. I got this Polybius video. I've got another Retrohoy video. I want to do something about the Amiga. There's one particular topic that I'd like to look at, Amiga-wise, that uh, I think will come up. Should be interesting if you're interested in your, your sort of the transitional period from 8-bit to 16-bits. That's really the crux of the Amiga video. But uh, it should be cool. Um, what else do I want to do? Oh yeah, this sort of health, maybe the chickenometer video, maybe. Uh, and then after that, I'll probably do another retro hoy for good measure. I don't know, maybe something of a different era to, uh, to what I have covered before in the past. I might push the millennium a bit. Sort of look around the... Uh, between 1998, 2004, that sort of period, just to balance out stuff. Because I haven't done too many newer games. Uh, one more question from Discord. Uh, Justin says, if you were trapped on a desert island and you could only bring 10 movies to watch, ignore the lack of TV, imagine it's already there, what 10 films would they be? I'd probably just take 10 copies of Space Jam. I think that would get me through. Anyway, I shall wrap it up here. We've hit the 20 minute mark. And I'm a little bit pushed for time, if I'm honest, uh, because my son is currently napping. Uh, although I'm not sure if he is. I think he might have woken up, so I've got to go and tend to him. But I am glad that we were able to spend this nap time together, and I hope that I'll be able to spend another nap time with you soon. Soon in ahoy terms, anyway. But uh, thank you for watching, and until next time, farewell. Hello, what's this? The video's been running for a little while. Has he forgotten to trim off the end? Or is he about to give us a sneak preview of his forthcoming video? Ooh. There is a video game that doesn't exist. It's a myth, an urban legend, a hoax. It's called Polybius, and you might have heard of it. Let me take you back to 1981, back when arcade games were at their peak. A multi-billion dollar industry, and a fever that had a grip on pop culture. Video arcades were a new social nexus, and had sprung up everywhere. Dimly lit by neon light, Adorned with garish carpet, they played host both to crowds of teenagers and cabinet after cabinet of the hottest games of the era. Space Invaders, Pac-Man, Donkey Kong, Galaga. However, in an unnamed arcade in some sleepy suburb of Portland, there lurked something more obscure. A limited release of a game that would evaporate as silently as it appeared. The stories are vague, the cabinet is described as plain, and the gameplay? Weird looking, abstract, fast action with puzzle elements. Sometimes it's described as being particularly addictive, despite the unassuming appearance. The only concrete details are the name, year of release, and the company behind it. Polybius, 1981, Zinis Lotion. Really, it was just like any other arcade machine. Except for the side effects. Reports of sickness, amnesia, night terrors and behavioural changes followed those who played it. It was no accident either, if you believe the rumours. Instead, a secret project by government agency, developed from military tech for the CIA or some other man in black. The machines were observed, gameplay records were taken, and then, after a month or so, they disappeared without notice, along with any shred of evidence. To this day, no authentic cabinets, boards or dumped ROMs have surfaced. But there are some who claim to hold them.
All right, that's it. That's all you're getting for now. It's not even finished. Uh, but that's the intro. There's about another 57 minutes of video to follow it. But hopefully it's done wet your appetite. Anyway, keep it a secret. Don't tell anyone. Thanks. Bye. Sorry, I mean. <sighs> Thank you for watching. Farewell. <laughs>